and you no longer live under the threat that tomorrow I'm going to have to say goodbye to you. Like on December 20th on my show, we're all going to say goodbye to each other here in Boston, not knowing if we're ever going to see each other again. I mean, not literally ever, but essentially that we're going to go our separate ways and not be part of each other's lives. So you're always in this weird places. I'm either, you are either going to be a central person in the history of my life, as Scott Wolf or Nev Campbell were, or Matt Two Fox turned out to be, or the writers I got to know, or the directors, you are either going to be the most important people in my life, or I am almost never going to see you again. That's a weird way to live. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Charles Mertzbacher. I'm the vice president of the MPC, and I also am the director of the production program at Boston University in the Department of Film and Television. And I'm really happy uh, to be moderating this session with Chris Kaiser, who is the showrunner on the uh, as yet unnamed Netflix uh, series, one of the several series that Lisa mentioned that have come to the state recently. Uh, it's very exciting. So I'm not going to do much in the way of an introduction. As you'll hear, Chris has really impressive credentials, um, but I think they'll just come out in the context of our, of our discussion here. What we're going to do, just so you have a sense of what's going to go on here, is we're going to talk for an hour, and then we'll have about 10 minutes of, of questions. So if you have questions, hold them, and we'll, we'll get to you. I just want to start with a quote. This is, I don't know if you, if you caught this. this is, I thought this was sort of a cultural moment that, that the New Yorker puts on the cover of a film shoot going on in some Manhattan street. And uh, there's a would-be screenwriter sitting at her laptop uh, with the usual screenwriting books next to her. And in this issue, this is from, uh, from uh, September, there's a, a profile of the Oscar-winning director, Sam Mendes, directed American Beauty, among a lot of other work. Um, and he has this to say. He's talking to a bunch of film students in England. And he says, the director as a concept, as a cultural phenomenon, is dying. Coppola of The Godfather, Scorsese of Taxi Driver, Tarantino of Pulp Fiction, these figures are not going to emerge in the way they did in the 20th century. The figures who are going to emerge will come out of long-form television. Now is an unbelievable time to be alive and a storyteller. The amount of original content being made, watched, talked about is unprecedented. You're in the strongest position if you write. If you're a writer, you can also be a showrunner. A showrunner is the new director. So how does it feel to be the king of everything? <laughs> the, uh, so, I did, I but did my, not realize it until now. <laughs> no, one, no one's treating so, me that way. <laughs> so uh, that term showrunner, it's been sort of around in the, uh, in, the, in, in the language of production for a couple decades now. Yeah. But I think still people have some confusion. Like all sort of producing related titles, it's, it's hard to get your arms around what it is. Yeah, you know, and it's not described, for example, in the Writers Guild contract. There's no such thing There's as no a There's no such thing, run. right? Right. There are other jobs. You're an executive producer. You're the highest ranking person on a show. But showrunner is, is a thing that just happened and is it's not an official So title. it usually shows up on screen as a producing credit. Right. You, you, see, you, you might see it as crea a created by credit, although it is not necessarily true that the person who is running the show is the person who created the show. It may be. I mean, I can talk about what a showrunner does. No, I do want to talk about yeah, that. And yeah. just among the many credits we can, we can uh, bandy about here is uh, Chris was co-creator of Party of Five, which was a really successful series on Fox for, for six years, six seasons. A were long you, time ago. Were, were you considered the sh in that era, did they call you the showrunner? Yeah, yeah we, we were, were the showrunners back then. Showrunning, the idea of showrunning really began around the time the television changed from um, a world in which we, ongoing stories were told, and the, somebody needed to make sure that they understood the entire arc of the season at once. So for example, you really look back to people like Stephen Bochco, um, Stephen Cannell, who at, at that period of time began to tell different kinds of stories in television. If you, I mean, if you're old enough, you remember that, and it's still true now, that in the 50s or 60s, you'd watch shows that were entirely episodic, Gunsmoke or or you know a, a cop show, or a, you know a, Do a Marcus Welby, or whatever it was. Every single episode was an individual episode. The characters were the same. There was almost no ongoing story. Much of it was written by freelance writers who came in just to write that episode. And there were some people who would do the rewriting. But there's no real need for that same kind of overarching feeling. But then around the time that shows, and I think. Until The Sopranos came out, Hill Street Blues is probably the most important drama in the history of television because it changed fundamentally the way we tell stories. At that point, even though it was still a 
22 episode season, more or less, and we told them the way that it, they were delivered the way that television had been delivered for decades, which is you had to watch it a given, on a given date at a given time, and you didn't see reruns until the summer. Even though all of that was true, Stephen Bochco began to tell stories in which character arcs um, were critically important to um, investing in the show. And in order to do that, somebody had to be there from day one to the last day. The writing took place while filming was going on, and suddenly the writer who was in charge of the story was in charge of everything. So it began then, and it's become, we, we focus on it now, I think, only because people are thinking about television more than they used to. It was, it was still, even in that time, although I would say that some of those shows were as good as anything that was produced, it was still a kind of a stepchild to movies, and so as, as Sam Mendes would say, you would think about directors and writers of television were less well known. Although Stephen Bochco was plenty well known, and David Kelly was too. Anyway, but right, now but this is yeah, this is the 21st century is where the ascendancy of these these series right. really has exactly. shown a light on the role. Right, and would, and and also the public, by the way, is just much more knowledgeable about everything. You know, it didn't used to be true that everyone knew everyone, everything was box office and yeah, ratings and all of that it. stuff. And now everyone knows the insides and outsides of everything. So the idea that you know who's running shows matters. I, I was never, we never, as, sh as people who ran shows, sought any publicity. We never thought of trying to get attention. I'm not trying to do that now either. I mean, being here is nice, but it, I, I'm also perfectly happy to be in a room alone writing or editing. Um, but people pay attention all of a sudden to people who run television shows. And that's, you know, I guess that's nice, although it's not necessary. Yeah, I, I get what you mean. That somebody like Shonda Rhimes is a, is almost a household name, really. Public I, figure. I she think is television commercial. I think you can say yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you can give a number to this. Are all showrunners always writers? Do they come out of the writer's room, or are there showrunners who are not writers? Almost all showrunners are writers, but they're not all writers. And increasingly, not a large percentage, but in the world in which shows are sometimes produced in chunks of six or eight or 10, when a lot of the pre-production and writing happens before it's shot, directors are also showrunners. So there's some really f well-known examples of, you know, Carrie Fukunaga and David Fincher being the showrunners of the shows that they do, and they're able to do that. Traditionally, it was the writer because it was the writer who was there on day one, on the day that the first idea was developed for what the season would be about and who needed to continue the writing all the way through and then became the, the person or people who oversaw everything. But it's not, it's not, a, a, it's not a, a rule that it must be a writer. But it's, so, it, so would you, um, you know. It, um, Writers make the most sense in some ways. Right. Without getting too into the, we can go into the whole history of television, but if we just stay with the present day in terms of sort of the new, I call it the platinum age of television because the golden age is already taken. It's supposed right. to be back when they did Playhouse 90 and all that. But right. this era we're in, you know, a lot of people have said it's, it's, it's really the ascendancy of a particular type of, we still call it television for want of a better term, but the streaming phenomenon mm -hmm. of Netflix and Amazon and all of that, which we're going to dive deep into here. Uh, is, is that world a writer's, is, is it fundamentally a writer's medium? You know, there's, it's said that theater is a writer's medium. You can't change a word in a play without getting the writers sign off on the script. Is, is the world of television now a writer's it's medium? It's fundamentally a writer's medium. It still is, of course, um, because, the, the, because we're essentially writing long novels in some sense for the screen, and the person who creates that ongoing story is the, is the critical um, factor in that. As I said, it's not impossible for that to happen with a director. For example, on my Netflix show, I am partnered with a director, Mark Webb, who probably some of you know because he directed 500 Days of Summer and Spider-Man and a bunch of other movies. He'd done some pilots like, um, and shows like Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. And he and I, who we knew each other, and we came up with this together and we run it together. And that's great. That collaboration works really well. So it's not, it doesn't have to be, as I said, but it is naturally that way. And we come out of a history of I mean, the, those, you know, like Shonda or anyone else, they, we know how to do those things because we have spent our lives writing at the same time as we're overseeing casting and production and post-production. We do all of those things simultaneously. In the old days, I know m many of you probably know how this works, but a television show that begins production on a given day then runs continuously through production without breaking. So if you're shooting for eight days, every eight days another episode starts, and you do that for 60 or 150 or whatever number of days you need. But while you're producing an episode, you're prepping the 
episode before, you're writing the four episodes that come before that, eventually you're posting for three or four. So all of this stuff is happening simultaneously. That's a little less true now with short orders. Some of it happens earlier and later, but by and large, the whole thing is simultaneous. So the job of a showrunner, which is often the writer's job because he or she is the one who understands the full creative vision, is to do every one of those same things every single day on six or seven or eight or nine episodes all at once. But it's also why you're the, con you're the, the common thread that runs through the whole thing in a way. Right. Because you've got different writers who are sort of primary writers on episodes, and you've usually got, and I want to talk about this, because I think the Netflix series you're working on is maybe a little bit of a different story, but many times, if you watch Narcos or something like that, you'll notice that there are certain repeat directors, but they tend not to direct back-to-back -back episodes. Can't, right. For the yeah. reason that, that Chris just mentioned, which is that right. they're right. prepping while something else is... Right. By and large, yeah, there's a three-episode uh, period of prep, shoot, post that directors do. There are, there's an opportunity for directors to repeat, and then in some of these shorter seasons, if you prep everything beforehand, I think Matt Weiner directed every episode of the Romanovs, and Carrie Fukunaga directed every episode. That's the thing, there are some, right. and what about so, the Netflix series that you're No, doing? I'm, we, uh, Mark, Mark is doing um, three episodes, but so kind of all other, about. and we're a first year show, we're trying people out, we have seven other directors, we're also, and I think at least talk about this, we're very focused on the idea of making sure that we hire um, in a way that reflects the whole world, so we have committed and we have five m women and five men or five m slots directed by women. Um, so those are all, and many of them are, some of them are, have directed for a little bit before, but a lot of them are pretty new because the idea is not just to take the hundred women directors and give them lots of jobs, but to take, you know, give women directors opportunities so there are 300 eventually or 400 or 500, so there are a bunch of people who are doing our show who haven't done a lot of episodes before. We're not the only ones, but it's, um, we also have, you know, we have 60% women writers on the show. You know, the, the show is, um, we're, but, and, and there's other diversity as well. We're not, it's just not, it's not just gender diversity. But all of those reasons are the reasons why for us, we're actually giving people opportunities to direct a single episode rather than multiple episodes in this particular case. And that, of course, in some ways means that the job of the showrunners is even greater because there is, none of those directors have the sense yet, particularly in a first year show, of what the overarching creative vision is. They can't. We show them the episodes, we let them read the scripts, but they can't know I want to dig into that. So, you know, a show like, because uh, we're familiar with it, uh, Party of Five, but another show I can put out there that you can all go see tonight if you haven't already watched it uh, on Amazon, Chris was one of the uh, uh, co-show runners on, uh, on uh, The Last Tycoon. Right, last year. And uh, that was made by Amazon. Amazon, yeah. Um, so if you're keeping score here, he's dealt with some very big organizations, Fox, Amazon, Netflix. Uh, but in, in each of these cases, The Last Tycoon was an adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Netflix series is original, mm -hmm. original story. Party of Five, original. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, each of these things, I haven't seen the Netflix series, no one has, but uh, I did see The Last Tycoon and I've watched Party of Five, and there's an absolute, you know, you can go from season one of Party of Five to season six, and there's still a certain tone to that show that runs through the whole thing. How is that inculcated? Since you've got all these moving parts, you've got different directors, you've got writers who are busy working individually on scripts, how do you, because I think that must fall heavily on the shoulders of the showrunner, to provide that voice, that, that unified voice. Right. How is that done? Well, let me say two things about that. First is, and I'll answer the question directly in the second part of this. The first thing is, I really like shows that are kind of a, they're a box, and you gotta stay inside the box. But there's space inside the box for some variation. I grew up watching, before I even thought I was going to write TV, watching shows like 30-something was one of my favorite shows when I was younger. And in 30-something, you could absolutely tell what writer wrote which episode, that Marshall and Ed, who ran it, um, had allowed people to have creative voices inside the larger creative box of the show. I thought that was really good. Um, I think if you watch Party of Five, it's too long ago now. We had a lot of great writers like Susanna Grant, who was, awesome. you know, right, Aaron Brockovich and P.K. Simmons and a lot of amazing people. And if you watch their episodes and you know the show well, you can actually tell that there are meaningful differences in the way they've interpreted the general theme of this. If you watch Last Tycoon, I did Last Tycoon with Billy Ray, who wrote Captain Phillips, and he's now writing almost every movie in Hollywood, I think. <laughs> um, and he's amazing. He's also a great director. Um, 
and he and I wrote, I mean, we had a, a shared vision, but we also wrote slightly differently. And if you watch Billy, the episodes Billy wrote, and the, or that he principally wrote and the ones I wrote, there are some differences. I think that's good. Um, and it's also true that directors can be slightly different in the way they interpret. I think that's all okay. Having said that, there are a bunch of checks to make sure that, broadly speaking, you feel like you're watching the same show. I mean, the writers in the writer's room spend months and months and months together, sometimes eight or nine months in a long show, for hours three or four. And we all work together, but I'm there all the time. I give notes on scripts. I give notes on outlines. We're very particular about that. So we understand both how the show arcs, but also how it more or less stays the same in tone. Though we have varying directors, we have one DP, Attila Zalei, on this show, who understands the, the visual language of the show that was established by him and by Mark Webb in the first episode. And that, though it is not dictated absolutely to directors, is a guide for directors when they, they work on the show. Those directors who come in get to see all the previous cuts. They watch dailies. Um, the, producing, uh, the producer of the show, Pavlina Hutupis, is there every day ensuring that there's some continuity of vision. Many shows, we do not have something called a producing director, who is a director who stays, he or she, is on the show every single episode. Um, he or she may direct a few of them, but they're on set to make sure that there's some continuity. So there are all kinds of checks to make sure that the show doesn't go outside of the, the, the reasonable box. Also, the actors begin to understand who they are, and they are also a, a you know, they, they're a kind of limiting factor in the way in which the show might swing wildly out of what its comfort zone is. It's, it's fun. I, once upon a time, I was, uh, I was on the set many, many years ago of Hill, Hill Street Blues, mm -hmm. And I was, I was sort of assigned to, to be a fly on the wall watching the camera department. Um, and the director was directing a scene in the camera, and the DP turned to me and said, we know how to do this. I mean, it was like season seven or something. Right. And he said, you know, it, it was almost a show that at that point was kind of running itself because the actors had been those characters for so right. many years right. and they had done so many setups a certain right. way in certain sets. And it was sort of like, we know how this works right. at this point. That's a good thing and a risk. You, know, uh, you yep. can imagine yep. how that could mm -hmm. become uh, right. uh, could become threaded. Right. So we're you know. not at that point yet. We're still thinking. I mean, this new show. We're five episodes in. We've been shooting for you know forty days or something like that. We're figuring stuff out, but we're hitting a rhythm and beginning to understand the things that work really well. And you start cutting things together, and you see what works and what doesn't. Do so you figure it out. Do you have a f this term gets used a Bible? I mean, is there a Bible? That is, the Bible traditionally was really a place where it actually often had character breakdowns and things like that, like that defined who's who and what's right. going on and what's happened in the past. A show like Party of Five, there were 143 episodes. We'd have any Bible on Party of Five. Um, I mean, w there are a couple of things that are different now. In the old days, it was very much a pilot-based um, system. So on Party of Five, we, uh, in fact, the network said, hey, you want to do a show about kids without parents? It was not our original idea. We went in to pitch something, and they said no, and they said, what about this? And we said, that's terrible, but we'll think about it. Um, <laughs> that seems cheesy. Um, and then we came back and said, here's a way we might do it. Um, but we wrote a script, and we had, I assume, as we often did, a few pages on what we would do in subsequent seasons. And then we wrote a pilot, and it was based on the pilot that that show was picked up. On my Netflix show, there was no, we didn't shoot a pilot. We went straight to series. I had a script that I had actually written for Showtime about four years earlier. Mark and I had pitched it around, and Showtime had bought it. They decided not to make the pilot. I had a script, and one of the Netflix execs who had heard it in a different room, Matt Donnell, who uh, was working at the CW at the time, said, hey, or is that still available? Then we went through a six-month process or so of development in which we fiddled with the script, and I wrote a relatively short Bible, 30 pages long. You know, that gave us a pretty clear sense, me, a, a, some idea of where I was going to go in the first season. But I don't, and it had some elements of the second and third season, but it's not so detailed. Billy, on the other hand, wrote a 120-page Bible for Last Tycoon for his, own, for his own sake. So sometimes you do and sometimes you don't have that. But you'll find, even though I think we stick with it a little bit, that stuff changes in the moment. You know, you get into the room with a bunch of writers, and the stories that you thought were good aren't always the stories you want to tell. Also, the obligation, anyone who's written knows that the general idea of what a conflict might be is not the same thing as figuring out what a scene is. And you've got to actually write scenes, not idea, you know, big ideas for things. And so the Bible changes as you develop that. And then if you're lucky enough, although it's less true in a short show, you begin to shoot stuff, and you see actual 
actual actors doing it, and you fall in love with some things, you think that's interesting and that's less interesting. And then the Bible also changes because you say, I'd rather do that than do that. And so television shows, one of the nice things about a television show, and it's scary, I think, for actors or writers a little bit, is it evolves as it goes along. You know, in a, in a feature, you hand an actor a script and a director a script, and you say, this is everything it's going to be. You know the beginning and the end. Go off and do it. And here, the actors are living the show a little bit, and we live it a little bit like life, which is we don't know what tomorrow is going to be when we do this. We know some things, so we can protect ourselves from behaving in a way that's going to directly contradict itself. But it is possible by the time we get to episode 10 that we have found something else we're interested in than we thought we were going to be interested in when we wrote episode 1. So that makes it it's a dynamic thing. It's a fun thing. It's a little scary. Um, and, um, but a Bible, therefore, becomes only it, it's helpful, it, it'll only but get you not so that, far. You can only go so far. Yeah. So, um, you know, e, 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 not to, I'm, I'm raising this question not so much to talk about sort of television history, but because it sort of can maybe be the closest thing we have to a way of predicting what it's like when you have a stranger, Stranger Things, or something like that that sort of takes off and becomes a, a show everybody wants to watch. Or Game of Thrones, obviously. Um, you're suddenly writing this in the case of Dream of Thrones, literally riding a dragon, um, that's, that's taking off. You had that happen with Party of Five. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you wrote a pilot, pilot gets picked up, series gets made, you've got some ideas for season one. Six years later, you're still making the show. What's that like to be, I mean, it still applies today. If you get renewed season after season, is that, I, I would assume that's what everybody lives for as a writer, you wanna, you want that success. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had, <clears throat> Party of Five was a particular, I have never had a really, really successful show. You know, like a really big hit. Party of Five did well, you know, and it was, it was a sort of thing of the moment. But it would, I bet it would be really fun to have a Game of Thrones. That'd be incredible. Um, I have no idea what that's like. Party of Five was the lowest rated show on television for a long time. It was almost certainly to be canceled. We lived, we were so afraid every single minute. We were sure we were going away, that, that the network was going to pull the plug. We had actually gotten a call at some point from the studio saying, we've gone over the network, and they used to have a big board where all those shows were. And they said, you've been erased from the board. You're done. Um, for some reason, and they kept on changing presidents of Fox, and, and John Matoyan became the president of Fox, and he was amazing, and he kept us on. And we were still just barely surviving. And then slowly, we started airing these episodes that, that caught on, and at the end of the first season, we won this thing the TV Guide did, the best show you're not watching. And that was like a little bit of something, and then we won the Golden Globe the second season, which was sort of a fluke, I think, although nowadays you look back and say it's not so much a fluke, because the Hollywood foreign press likes doing stuff like that, so, but you didn't know that back then. And suddenly, we were a show that was viable, and then we became a thing, and we became one of Fox's you know, signature shows. It was the best, the, it's not about, for me, it was not about the idea that there were lots of people around who were, ex I love the fact that we had an audience, and, and we would actually go to these things where there were screaming fans for the actors. They weren't screaming for us, they were screaming for them. That didn't really matter very much. What mattered is exactly what you were talking about, is that we would know at the end of one season that we were coming back, because having a television show, if it goes well, is like having a theater company. You have these people who live with each other back then for nine or 10 months of the year, not quite so long anymore, in really close quarters. In that case, we were living in LA because people still did much production in LA, but wherever you're doing it, and you make this thing together, and you begin to know each other in a way, and you no longer live under the threat that tomorrow I'm gonna have to say goodbye to you. Like on December 20th on my show, we're all gonna say goodbye to each other here in Boston, not knowing if we're ever gonna see each other again. I mean, not literally ever, but essentially that we're gonna go our separate ways and not be part of each other's lives. So you're always in this weird place as I'm either, you are either gonna be a central person in the history of my life, as Scott Wolf or Nev Campbell were, or Matt Two Fox turned out to be, or the writers I got to know, or the directors, you're either gonna be the most important people in my life, or I am almost never gonna see you again. That's a weird way to live. I mean, you all know about it because you're all in this business. But not having to worry about that, feeling like you're coming back, is a wonderful feeling. And you know, we never wrote differently because more people watch the show than fewer. I didn't tend very much, although it's harder now, to listen to what people told me they wanted on a show because I just wrote what I thought was the way the show should be, or Amy and I did. So I'm not, I wasn't, and maybe that's because I'm old and you know, I'm not attuned in the same way to this kind of constant interaction between fans and creators like Shonda Rhimes obviously is, but that wasn't a thing. It was a, it's really nice that people are watching. You want that to happen. Even still, it was a pretty small audience. Um, 
But that but, is a big difference today is that if you had a show that had, say, a young generation that was really shaped by it and that kind of got hooked and was watching it right. once a week, nowadays they'd be posting stuff on Instagram right. and so forth with their responses. Do you think that changes the, the, the social network part of the whole thing? Is that, does that in any way change what you guys are doing? The, that, that echo chamber we of where? Talk again in a year. I mean it because I mean I, I I don't you know the last two shows I've done I did a show called Tyrant on FX which was a great experience but it was not a younger audience it had very little audience last tycoon on Fox uh, on Amazon had an older audience there was not that kind of interaction um, this is the first time for a long time I've gone back to a show that is probably going to have a younger audience so I don't know it's like coming back and like waking up like Rip Van Winkle and finding out the world has changed since the last time you wrote a show about teenagers. And maybe it will be different. I don't know. So we should just define, because some of you may know, I only know a very little bit and we are only allowed to know a very little bit because this project is pretty tightly under wraps. But can you just define what this series is that you're doing for Netflix? Yeah, it's essentially a show about a town that makes a terrible mistake and it's, it's punished for it in, by having its children removed. Um, and they are moved to another place and they need to, it's a Lord of the Flies kind of story and they're only the older kids, 17 and 18 year olds. And so it's a, it's a story about a society of people on the cusp of adulthood who need to decide what kind of world they want to create. It is mostly, it's interested in everything um, from who loves whom and who likes whom, but at its heart it's a question of what world, what, what political, economic, social system would you establish? Would you make the same mistakes your parents did or would you start fresh and do something new? So that's what the show is. You have, and it's all a, the actors are. I don't know if Kiara is here in the room, but it's because one of the actresses who's on the show who's great is here. Um, um, but um, it's all these actors from 19 to 25, like 17 of them. They're really great. Um, so, so, uh, so uh, that sounds really intriguing. I can tell from the we have future viewers here in the audience. Um, that's Netflix. Yeah, you and I were talking out in the lobby before uh, that the amount Netflix is committed to production is simply staggering. I mean, I've heard the figure $10 billion, mm -hmm. which is Most just of that is not for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> well, that's the other thing is, I mean, yeah. they're making hundreds of, just Netflix I know. alone is making hundreds of shows and with that 10 billion, but that's still a very big number. And then Amazon, I think, something like eight billion. I mean, these numbers are just like they're greater, seriously greater than the GDP of certain countries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and 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 then in contrast to that, and then uh, there are other players getting involved, Apple and so forth. And in contrast to that, the studios, the, the traditional motion picture studios, have committed for that same period two two billion. So there's this enormous shift of resources towards. Uh, making mm -hmm. all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I have several questions about this. First of all, before I get sidetracked, we can talk about sort of the sheer volume of stuff being made, but I'm also just curious about your experience. You work for both the traditional networks, the Foxes, and you've also worked for Amazon, which is this whatever, you know, <laughs> this thing that's taking over the world, and then, and then you've worked for Netflix, which is the streaming giant. Mm -hmm. Can you, in a thumbnail, sort of define how is the traditional network model different from the way these new kids do stuff? Is there, you know, in terms of oversight, in terms of who you report to, yeah, how, much, are, how much oversight there is? Yeah, it's a, it's a complicated question because there's so many little pieces of it. They are, are somewhat, broadly speaking, they're not that different, right? You know, mostly, almost everything we do is sort of the same in every place. You know, you, there's, a, there's a rhythm to making a season of television, whether it's longer or shorter. It's, the shortness of the season has a lot to do with it, and we can talk about that at some point. There were some specific things about working for a broadcast network like Fox or ABC or anything I worked for. One of them was that you went through a traditional pilot process, um, and you don't do that here. And they were pretty in, you know, so, they so, were- So neither Amazon or Netflix Well, Amazon is, does pilot sometimes, not always. Netflix doesn't, but people are moving away from the pilot process in large measure, and they're making shows based on writer's rooms or scripts and Bibles kind and of things a package. Like, and the, 
and sometimes the, you know, the package is not irrelevant in that. It may be. I mean, in our case, Mark and I didn't have an actor and they're um, attached, so it wasn't a package in that sense. So there, those things are different. And there, we could spend a lot of time talking about the development process because it's really interesting. I mean, it's interesting to me how the development process has changed and the implications for it. The networks are all more or less intrusive in the point, from the point of view of giving notes and things like that. I think the broadcast networks are generally more. If you have a very successful show, they lay off. So by the time we finished doing Party of Five, we had a good relationship with all of those people in the long run. It's not generally adversarial. It's pretty good the way people work together. Um, the networks have, I think, a problem, which is that they are still trying to be broadcasters so that they, they tend to flatten things out and smooth out the edges, and so you end up with more problems there. And we, and we also did this years ago, so there were other kinds of issues back in those days. For example, there was an episode we wanted to do about one of our characters having an abortion that we ended up being not, were not allowed to so, do because- So that's standards and practices? That was the affiliates. The standards and the network was going to allow us, but then the affiliates said, oh, no, we can't air that. So the, uh, the local um, station. So there are things that would happen then that are less likely to happen now, but that's partially about the change in the system. And it's also partially about the fact that we're many decades later. Amazon and Netflix were somewhat, are, are somewhat different. Amazon was slightly more you know, involved in the, in the noting process. Netflix, though they are intensely collaborative, is very respectful. One of the things, different things about Netflix is that the executives I deal with on that show and they are not the president, the head of the network. Of the network. They, are, they, they have the power and the responsibility to green light shows. So my executives were the champions of my show. They are deeply involved in it all the way through. That's a really meaningful thing because you, you're not guaranteed that. And for example, at Amazon, there was a turnover in the leadership and what the people, one of the people we had on our show was not a person who was deeply connected to our show. And I don't think that helped very much. The show got canceled. Um, this show may get canceled as well. The fact that I have executives who, are, who have the, uh, the power to say yes doesn't mean that somebody else higher up is not eventually going to say no. But it meaningfully changes the way I creatively deal with them, and it makes it a, an extremely wonderful creative environment. I really love that part of working at Netflix. Having said that, by the way, I love working at FX. John Landgraf and the people at FX are very similar in that way. They're, they're incredibly smart and collaborative in a really good way. So it's just, you know, it, it varies from person to person and network to network. Are, are, um, are there, is there the equivalent of a standards and practices unit in a place like, you know, standards and practices are sort of the people who make sure that the, the, the language being used or the themes being yeah. put out there are somehow meet with the community standards. Yeah. I haven't dealt with, there's no, I don't talk to any specific person like I used to who would say, you cannot use this word or show this thing on Netflix. We have broad conversations about what, you know, the sexuality on the show and what we show and what we won't or what language we use. But that's just a conversation like, is this, are we going too far in this direction? Is this, is this serving the show or not? I have never had anyone say, no, you can't do that. If anything, actually, I'd pull back myself on some things. In, in doing the show thing. I don't need that. I don't need to be that explicit in this show. I thought, I thought the show was going to be raw or with regard to sexuality. It's not necessary. Um, I mean, it's still sexy, but it doesn't need to, it, it doesn't need to be um, explicit in order to do that. But that was me, not the network, and they would have let anything. And there's language on the show is whatever I write. Although they sometimes say, could you, you know, maybe one less um, of that particular Expletive epithet would be good, um, <laughs> but I'm not. Yeah, epithet. Yes, so, barnyard epithet, well, as it was once yeah. called in the uh, Watergate days. So, 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 uh, y y you've done both adaptations and original stuff. Um, do you have a predilection for one or the other? Is there? Is it nice to have a kind of you know? You take the last tycoon, it exists. The story right. exists. Is it good to have that, or is would you rather always work from if you? If you had a magic wand, would you always work from original material? You know, it's, it's good ideas are the things that strike you, and so it's hard to pick and choose and say, I wish I didn't have this or that. The Let Tycoon excited me and Billy very much because of the idea of both, it's about 30s Hollywood and making movies, but for us it was about the meaning of who tells stories and whether stories are true or not true and whether we need to lie to ourselves about who we are, whether those lies are good or bad. That stuff was really interesting. It was complicated to do something based on existing material. Um, because there are some 
things, you know, there are places you can't go. You need to be, you need to be somewhat careful about that, though you can't, and Billy talks about this a lot because he's done a lot of adaptations. You also are not to be too fastidious about being, um, you know, beholden to the original material. Your job is not to make that again. Your job is to make a good story using all of that. So it gets, it's a complicated thing. The Game of Thrones guys are amazing in the way they're able to adapt that from one medium to another. Um, I thought it was a little problematic for us because there were expectations of Fitzgerald from the point of view of critics and things like that. It was really fascinating to see the extent to which people were upset or disappointed or, or ha some people were happy about the way we had expanded the story. Last Tycoon, by the way, is an unfinished novel. So right. we, in fact, we, we had a lot of leeway to say this is what's going to happen. The, the Our show only had a little bit to do with the stuff that was written in the the short piece of the novel that Fitzgerald had written before he died. The characters became important to us and we created new ones. That was really fun to do. Um, but there's also, and, and it's great sometimes to have something to fall back on, but though as I said, I think in our case on Last Tycoon, because there were only a hundred, a couple of hundred pages of the whole thing, it's not like we had much more than some, you know, we had character outlines for it. But even there, I know there's more detail than you probably want, even there Fitzgerald wasn't really sure who his characters were going to be. And there was some indication from the notes that he was going to change those. So we had a lot of flexibility, which meant we also didn't have a scaffold that was quite the way you would think of if you were adapting something, I don't know, like Handmaid's Tale or, um, or Game of Thrones or something from books that already exist. Now we have nothing. We're free to do whatever we want and to fall or to rise or whatever based on whether we make good or bad decisions. And, and how many, in the Netflix series, how many episodes are you doing for We're the first season? 10 week? in the first season. 10, which is, uh, you know, sort of normal. I think Pretty average. For net, yeah. Netflix, anyway, Pretty that average, seems to yeah. be what they like mm -hmm. to do. Yep. So 10, they're hour long? They are hour, and uh, although I haven't shown anything to them yet, so they may say it's too long, but they are really hour long. You know, in, in broadcast, uh, we got down to about 42 minutes and 40 seconds or something like that. So these are meaningfully longer episodes than the ones we did. So it's not, they are 10 episodes, but they are, if you think about them being one third as long, they're probably the equivalent of, you know, 13 episodes worth of material at least from um, the network point of view, 14, 14, something like that. So you get more. So, and compare that party of five era, the standards were what, 20? We did 22 to 24 two, episodes a season. 22 to 24, and those were like 40. Because it's 40 minutes long. 40 minutes long. Yeah. Um, so, is that a big change in terms of, I mean, it doesn't actually, the math, it's, it's different, but not radically different. I mean, you're still making a lot of content in 10. ten yeah, it's hugely different. It's entirely different. What, making 22 episodes of television is in such a grind. I mean, it's hundreds, I mean, 160, 70 days of production. And because you had to come up with new stories each time, I mean, first of all, you had to come up with new stories and everything. This is, I mean, it's great. I'm not, I'm not really complaining. I just can't imagine ever doing it again. Um, as I'm, um, but, you know, with all those act outs and you were four or five peaks to every single episode, so like 100 in one season, big ideas that would bring people back, and you were doing this, and um, you know, the stories had to be somewhat self-contained, because even though we were ongoing stories, we still lived in an era in which the network wanted to make sure that when it was running reruns, that people could watch a rerun on a given day, in a given week, even though they had been out on vacation the week before. So the idea was everything had to have some standalone elements. That's really hard to do. And you're um, reminding me also that thing that I've certainly heard people who do what you do talking about how they, they had to figure out, as though that's not hard enough, everything you just described, then also leading up to the break at the whatever minute mark it was, you right had right. to have a certain story point so that people wouldn't go off and mow their lawn and not come back. Right, right. You did all of that plus people probably won't remember this, there was such a thing as sweeps. Sweeps is when the networks found out, w w you know, dealt with the advertisers on how well their shows were doing. They, ca they happened in November and February, and then actually again in May, but February, uh, November and February. So you also had this obligation to have huge, dramatic conclusion. You had big episodes, like it was always like the very special episode was in November. And, and everything became a very special episode. So the very special episode. So, was, well, so anyway, so, so it's all of that stuff. Now, in 10 episodes, even though the episodes are a little bit longer, which actually in some ways just means we have time to, there's a little air in all of it, you know what I mean? That you can actually allow slightly longer scenes or things get a little more complicated. But I can see the end of the season from the beginning. I know at the beginning where I want to end up. 
Um, and it's so much easier to plan something like that. Um, and there, and we, you do 10 scripts, and you get done with the writing in, in less time. And I think a lot of why television is of generally higher quality now, and one of the reasons why, and it's just not, not just in the United States, but those of us who deal with other writers, industries, and other parts of the world, why other countries are also moving towards that kind of model is both because viewers want it, but viewers want it in large part because they're getting better storytelling. You know, that stories actually work pretty well sold, told in slightly smaller chunks. There's a reason why people generally don't want to read 700-page novels, right? And you don't really, I think, watching a 10-episode season or 12 or 8 is actually a really nice amount of story to get through and to tell before you move on to the next chunk of it. It works well. I mean, it's driven, by the way, by economics. All of this is driven by economics. As I said, you know, and, and, and we could talk about this, the entire history of television is mostly driven by economics. In television in the beginning, the television season began in September because that's when cars were sold. New models of cars came out in September, and so you sold cars in September, you started television, which advertised cars in September, and then you went a full year, and there are many, many episodes, and because you wanted to repeat those things, they needed to be standalone. And so things were written for the, st the season that went from September to the end of May, in, or even later, in the early days, they made 30 episodes. So it was all about how networks could make money off of it, and you wrote to that, and viewership, viewers began to expect certain things. You could only get something on a given day, at a given time, and you couldn't guarantee you were going to be there, so you had to make sure that whenever you tuned in, it made sense. Nowadays, all of these streaming services sell, I mean, they, they sell to million, hundreds of millions of people worldwide. They want you to watch all of the stuff as they stream it. They want it written as if you can't stop watching from one episode to the next, like you're just turning the page of a novel. And so suddenly, television storytelling becomes novelistic, and that turns out to be a pretty good thing. It is actually a way people want to watch things. But all of it is still driven by the fact that that's the way the content is delivered um, to people. Turns out that that works really well. We had a lot of fears about when you know, people went online that we'd be, be forced to cut up our stories into t very tiny chunks, into 10 minutes, because no one had any, any um, attention span longer than that, and you couldn't tell a story in, in shorter than that. Um, Zwickin Herskovitz, who did 30-something I'm talking about, came up with a show called Quarter Life very early on, which everything happened in 15-minute chunks. That show didn't succeed, whether it was because of the timing or not, I don't know. But that was a scary thing for writers. I didn't love the idea that we needed to tell everything in 10-minute chunks. It turns out that's not the way people want to watch things. They actually want to watch an hour or a half hour, and they want to watch multiple more of them together and they do it at home and they do them they stream them they do it like they read a great book and that becomes that has turned out by in some ways by happenstance and some ways by choice to be a really good way to tell stories such a good way to tell stories um, that it in the television has begun to replace features in, lar in a large degree so that we don't miss features in the way we thought we were going to because the movie studios have gone in the other direction the economics of the movie studios has suggested we should only make or mostly make big tentpole movies things that are going to sell for that are going to make billions of dollars and be accessible to an entire audience and we don't want to make too many of those because we're just cannibalizing ourselves we're going to make a very few movies. We don't want to make romantic comedies. We don't want to make comedies in general. There are all kinds of subjects we can't deal with because the world won't watch those all together. So you end up with some great movies, and at the end of the year, you end up with 10 or 12 movies that pop through that are really amazing, that are made by the smaller parts of the big studios or independents, and that's fine. But you're not missing movies the way you used to because television is taking that over and because we become used to the idea that we don't need to watch things together. Whether that's good or not is a different question, and I think some people may miss the idea of coming together as a community. And there's a lot to be said, I think, eventually, for the meaning of that, and to be said, um, talked about, about the fact that even television shows have more atomized viewership, so there are very few things that we talk about as a common culture, except for Game of Thrones, or maybe, oh, not even Handmaid's Tale, except on the coasts, exactly. I think. It comes down to, like, any given year is like one series. Like right maybe now, one right series. now it's ga Game of Thrones. It did, yeah. But, but people watch different things. That's good and bad. I think it's not great that we don't have any kind of common conversation, cultural conversation. It's a little bit bad when it comes to creative things. It's really bad when it comes to the fact that we don't actually talk to each other about things like politics and what we believe in, that everyone's only listening and watching to what they believe already. That's a real problem. On the other hand, television succeeds where movies do not in allowing local stories to be told to the whole world. So Netflix, for example, is producing shows all over the world in South America and India and Africa and Europe where writers are writing and directors are directing stories about their cultures that the whole world is watching. And that's, that is a really good thing. It's all, you know, obviously, it's, everything's a mixed bag. Yeah, right. 
Right. Well, that's what happens with yeah. tides of history. And there's no way to, you know, there's no way to stop it. It's so, just, it is what it is. So, so I'm, I'm conscious of time here. Yeah. We're, we're, we should talk about the economics we're, of it also, well, by the way. Where's, I want, where's my time? Keep it. So, so. At some uh, point, I, I want to talk about go, the economics for writers. Well, that's exactly yeah. where I was going okay. next. I just want to make sure we have time to, to we're going to go a few more minutes and have your questions ready. Um, but my question is, so another, another uh, uh, credit, you, I guess you could say, that Chris holds is that he was the president of the Writers Guild. He was term limited, <laughs> right? Uh, he had uh, two, two, uh, two terms as president of, writer, of the Writers Guild West, which is a very big deal because, as, as I think everybody knows, um, you know, the Writers Guild, SAG after the DGA, you know, some, these are some of the most important unions in the country, actually. Um, uh, they, they, they're, they're, the entertainment business is one place where the unions are still very, very influential. So my question is, um, this, this was only not so long ago, uh, 2011 to 2015, yeah. so those four years. That's a very interesting period in terms of all the stuff we were just talking about with this tide of the, the ascendancy of Netflix. Netflix existed as a thing where you got your DVDs in the mail, but I'm talking about as a streaming mm -hmm. medium. Mm -hmm. That's when that really happened. Um, was that the big, when you look back at your tenure as president, what was the, what are the markers you, you think of? Yeah, that's the most important thing that happened. So here's some general things about the business. Really good for the companies. It's the best it's ever been. They're making $50 billion a year, $40, $50 billion a year. And they do it more or less without risk now. There are lots of risks in the old days. They have much less risk now. You can tell that's true because those big conglomerates that used to buy up all these other ancillary businesses, they've gotten rid of all of them, and they just make entertainment. So they're doing very well. Um, and there are lots of people employed, maybe some more than were before, although remember the number of episodes is a little bit different from the number of television shows because we make fewer television shows and there's less development. Uh, um, fewer so television shows or fewer? We fewer. more television shows but fewer episodes, so the total number of right. episodes of television produced is not as ex is meaningfully different as the, it would sound like from the number of episodes. So there are more people working um, by some margin. Also, there's more creative freedom for writers and some directors uh, in this world than there was before. You can write stuff. It's really good because voices that would never be heard before get heard. Issa Rae is a really great example of that. And you know, there, there are more examples than before. So there are all these good things that are going on. But anyone who works, and I mean, I, I'd say that for writers, um, directors a little bit less. It's a little bit different, but it's not entirely different. And for actors, it is not a booming economic, uh, it's not a booming time uh, for their income. There have been a lot of problems that have happened, mostly driven by the move from long seasons to short seasons. Um, but we used to do 22 episodes or more, and employment you know, was a, essentially a full year thing. Now people work on small chunks of things, and a couple of things have happened. One is those 10 episode seasons tend to take as long as those 22 episode seasons, in part because you know, we're using that to do creative things that we didn't do before because television is a bigger scope, in part because jobs tend to expand to fill the time available, in part because there's no schedule. It used to be that you had to be on in September and you had to be done in February or in, in April or May and you had to get your pilot picked up and made and, um, you know, at a given time. All this stuff was very ordered. Now it isn't. The movie, the television business is a little bit more like the independent feature business. The last three shows I've done have taken five years to get on the air from when I developed. It used to be that it would always be within three or four months that you would know one thing or another. The point is, writers and um, actors are, they're finding their, their wages depressed. Um, uh, or at least they move back toward what the problem for us in the Writers Guild is that everyone's um, salary was moving back toward minimum. The way writer salaries work are you get a minimum amount of money per week and then your agents can negotiate more for you if you are somebody who, who has the clout because of the amount of work you've done to do more. And most writer income or much writer income came from above scale. Same thing. Um, would be true in some variation for actors. But because these jobs were expanding, but the number of episodes weren't, our, we would get 10 episode fees for 40 weeks instead of 22 episodic fees for 40 weeks. And that was the problem I dealt with most. We nearly went on strike over the fact that the, not by choice, I mean, a little bit by accident, and then be, to take advantage, the, the people who were producing the shows were employing all of us for really long periods of time for much, many fewer fees than we had before. And so writers' incomes were shrinking over and over again. Not absolutely in the sense that our minimums were going up, but our above scale was coming down. 
act actors have a, many of the same problems. It's not, it is not a great, now look, we do well. I'm not saying that one of the conversations that's hard to talk about maybe easier in this room than the rest of the world is. There's no question that, that um, writers do reasonably well with regard to the rest of the world. But anyone who's a writer or an actor knows that you have a shorter career and you're not sure you're going to work all the time. You know, you work every other year on average and you amortize what looks like a really good annual salary over two years instead of one year and you only work for 13 years instead of 25 years and suddenly that amount of money doesn't look so good anymore. Um, and it doesn't look so good when your employers have their profits going up by 100% over the last decade or so. So we're not, we are in a great creative time and a so-so economic time that gets confused by the fact that you find out that Shonda Rhimes is making hundreds of millions of dollars or that some actor, you know, Jim Parsons is making 20-something million dollars. For the work, working actors have a really hard time and working writers, uh, I mean most of, many of them don't work, have an increasingly difficult time making the, their year. Making your year is a really difficult thing, and you've got to keep getting jobs. So it's, it was tough, and it changed a lot when I, around the time that I was president. So, so but it does, I w my impression was, you know, when there was, a, there was a big fight in the Actors Guild a number of years ago, around the time that SAG and AFTRA merged, to put it in very, simplistic terms, some of it was because there was sort of a, there was a power base that were the very well-paid sort of star talent, or at least the people who were journey person actors who were getting a lot of work. And then there were just sort of the rank and file everywhere else. It would seem like when, one of the numbers I've heard is there were 460 something scripted series produced mm -hmm. in the last year. 460 scripted series. That's a lot of writing. So even, and I get what you're saying about like, any given writer is maybe not earning a living wage off of that. But well, I wouldn't say living wage. That's, that's going too far. Yeah, right. Yeah, but it's right. it's 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 tough to put your kid through private school or whatever. But no, that's going too far. Also, <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> can you sound better and better? <laughs> so, uh, but but so but that's that's but, the other side talking. But does it? Um, but has this has this shift of the sheer amount of stuff that's being made? Has it created a a flatter yeah. landscape, yeah. so it's you don't have sort of the haves, that is to say those writers who are sort of the star writers. You mentioned Shonda Rhimes. Okay, they're those people. But on the whole, you know, to make 460 scripted series, you got to have a lot of writers, and they're not all Shonda Rhimes. Right, so right. is there sort of a broader... Yeah, yeah, that's what's going, that's what's going on. I mean, uh, look, there's a, there's a very thin level of people who do incredibly well, probably better, as well as they've, they've done. Um, or maybe as well as they, uh, anyone is, uh, has ever done. Um, and there's some people who do better. But by and large, the middle class is flattening out, and they're flattening out by moving toward what our version of our Writers Guild minimum is. Um, and that's okay, and it would have been okay in 22 episode seasons. It's just difficult for people who are working many, many months and only get, we get paid, you know, like you, most people get paid episodic fees. So if you only get 10 episodic fees as opposed to 22, you can just understand why that's different for you. So the economics of these shows that do very, very well are paying these people somewhat less. It's become a problem. And actors, I think, also have that way. I mean, I, I'm hiring a lot of these young actors and you can't do, you can't be a lead in two series. So you're a lead in one series and that's most of your income, but it's only 10 episodes and it takes 12 months to produce, but you don't come back again for 18 months, and then your, your yearly salary is diminished over that. And then there, the actors under, who are not series regulars tend to get you know, taken advantage of a little bit. They, their, their salaries get depressed. I'm, I'm not, this is not a big complaint right now. We're not here to do that. I'm just saying it is interesting for those of you who work in the business to understand that we, at least, certainly in the Writers Guild, I don't, I'm not talking to SAG after now because I'm not the president of the Guild anymore, are dealing with a world in which, in general, Profits are skyrocketing and wages across the board are getting depressed. We are not fundamentally different in some ways from what's going on around the world. Now, wages have begun to rise in this country just recently, just a little bit. Right. Um, but by and large, they've been time, flat for about 25 flat. years, right? So um, we, are, we are definitely part of that. And we are lucky in many ways. So this is not a complaint. This is not about private school. This is about, um, this is about trying to make a life for 40 years out of the money you can make in bits and pieces over your lucky times and whether the lucky times added together are enough to actually create a life for you. And if it's not, there will always be people who are going to come back in because those of us who write or act or direct or produce do it because we have a dream of making something. So there are always going to be new people
people who want to be creative in that way. But there's pressure on them, um, as you know, it's it, because the world has changed a little bit. Time for questions. Yes, uh, right in the middle there. Yes. Thank you, since you've worked quite often with um, younger actors. Do you have times where you've developed a whole storyline and you've had to drastically change it because of a, a huge growth spurt? Because of what, I'm sorry, growth spurts? Growth, growth spurt, because um, I've seen that on certain series where s uh, the, wrong char the wrong actor has shot up and it changes the I've actually, dynamics. no, we haven't had that happen. I mean, the, like the oh. Party of Five kids, we just trapped them. The, the kids who played the little babies, we, we recast them periodically, but they didn't have any line. I mean, no, I meant like the, the, the ones that go from, say, age 12 to 13, but grow a foot. And no, we got really lucky. Like, oh. Scott Wolf stayed looking really young all the way through. I have no <laughs> idea what's going to happen here. But we tried, one of the things we tried very hard to do on this show, on the Netflix show, is not to go too old to play young. In other words, we, we're really casting pretty good. We're not casting minors, because that just has all kinds of implications for work hours and things like that. We're casting uh, people over the age of 18. But a lot of them are 18, 19, 21, 22. One or two of them are up into their mid-20s. But they're intended to look to be slightly more mature. We were worried about what would happen four years in if somebody began to develop early male pattern baldness as a, you know, like a, <laughs> it's like a 20-year-old, which is not impossible. I haven't had that problem yet. Um, but you never know. But uh, you know, here's the thing. It's, this is a version of the, of the conversation. I think we are going to get better at the idea of not being specific. And we have a very attractive cast, so it's very difficult for me to say this. But of not saying you need to look a, a given way and looking some other way is something we need to hide. Um, I'm, I hope we get better at that. Although I don't think you'll look at the show and think I'm a great champion of that, because it's an extremely attractive group of people. But we think about it. We think about the world looking the way the world should look some ways, but not worrying about, uh, do you look different? You just, you know, it's all a little bit of an illusion. So you buy the person as a character, and then you let go. Question down here. Thank you. So some of the fundamentals that you were talking about just a little bit ago, but also things, the seasons are different. So like everyone knows Game of Thrones has gone away from there. Right. Is it moving more towards, you know, I'm, when fall comes, it falls to the new stuff, and that doesn't always happen. So how has that played into it where, <laughs> Yeah, just, just to repeat the question. The question was that it doesn't seem like we are quite locked into the same season cycles so that a show, you mentioned Game of Thrones took a sort of a break before it goes to its final season and Stranger Things is also taking a longer time to make its third season. Is that changing? Uh, is that yeah, generally it's, it's, changing? Yeah, well, I mean, it is changing in that direction, except for the broadcast networks and even there, you know, having shorter seasons of some things. It's really complicated so for all of us. It affects everybody. So in the old days, um, where there was less work and fewer people to hire you, but you knew when you were going to get hired by, you know, by and large. Like if you were a writer, you would get hired on a show at the beginning of June when the show got picked up. And if you were an actor, you'd get either hired during the, the pilot process, which would probably happen in February or March to shoot, or you'd get hired on a television series once the show got picked up and started in production in July. Now it's everywhere, and you don't know when things are coming back, and writers move off of your show and need another job, and they leave and go do some other show. It's a, and you can't necessarily get them back. And there are there some rules, and that's part of the conversation we've been having. But you have to let people work. And actors are, you know, you don't have a season anymore. It, it makes the world very complicated for everybody because they don't actually have some kind of simple guarantees of when work is going to happen and not. And there's some good things about it, by the way. We used to cast pilots. Everyone, the whole world cast at the same time. You all cast like at the end of January, February, and it was like a mad dash to, you know, like when the well, housing market's really bad, that you'd have to go into a house and say, I want it before you look at all the rooms. You'd have to say yes to an actor because before somebody else took them away. And that was great for actors for a very brief period of time, but then bad for the ones who didn't get the job. Now, there's a little bit less of that, although volume is so heavy, it feels like you're always competing against people. So, yeah, it's, it is less secure. M more, it feels riskier in some ways. It's a weird, it's like audiences that have hundreds of shows as opposed to having four, but deal both with the advantage of opportunity and the anxiety of choice. So right now we live in a world that is filled with opportunity and the uncertainty of timing and whether you're missing something, you're not available. It's all this stuff has happened. The world is changing in that way. Um, so yeah, harder on actor, harder for us to keep our writers, more complicated for actors. We need to figure out when they're doing things. It's, it's, it's a different world. We have right here, yeah. Thank you, Charles. 
Uh, Chris, can you discuss, as you mentioned with the Guild, both from a creative and a business aspect, the evolution with the reboot now coming up of Party of Five versus what your expectations were initially going into it, and if possible, if you can channel Amy, your uh, writing partner, and her viewpoint if she's still involved with the current yeah, inception. Oh yeah, yeah. Amy's, doing, Amy's actually taking point on Party of Five. So we're doing a reboot of Party of Five. It's obviously a big reboot era right now, and I think that comes in large part of uh, the fact that the networks in particular in competition with 400 or so so shows, and 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 it's so finding it difficult as we all do to get an audience right now. Have found that brands matter, right? So a thing that people can identify actually brings eyeballs, and it's worked in really good ways. Obviously for Roseanne, the Connors, whatever it is, and may, I think maybe for Will and Grace and a bunch of other things. So it's become a thing. Amy and I thought about Party of Five, and whether we were going to do it. People talked about redoing Party of Five for a long time, and we really resisted it because we just didn't want to go back to doing the same thing before. There had then been a conversation about the idea of doing Party of Five where it had a twist where the family wasn't like a, just a white, you know, middle-class American family, and that was slightly more interesting to us. We decided to do it again because we finally came up with an idea that seemed worth doing. So the new Party of Five is about a Latino family living in the United States whose parents are deported and the children have to raise themselves. So it is only in very broad sense of the same thing. And it felt to us to be, in a way, a way of using the name and the broad general idea to talk about something that was specifically relevant now and not just to renew, redo something we had done before. So none of the old cast is back. They're all new people. It's really, the parents aren't dead. They live, you know, in, a, they, they move back to Mexico. So there's a, and that's a story. Um, we, we change it. So that, so that to us felt worth doing and we get some of the advantage of the reboot um, craze, but maybe less than others will because you're not seeing the same cast of characters and it's not really fundamentally the same thing. Um, but it is, I think it is driven mostly by the fact that um, you're just throwing your stuff out into an, a huge, vast, dark universe and hoping somebody pays attention and not knowing what's going to click. And you talked about this. Periodically it happens, like with Stranger Things or something else. And it's sort of a mystery. I have no idea. It's my biggest fear with the Netflix thing, which is they're really incredible. They are great partners. But at some point, they're just going to put it up and they're going to do some promotion for it. I don't know how much, but it'll be up against hundreds of other shows, and maybe people will watch, or maybe they won't. What I always wonder about, though, is a little bit like, like, um, it's like you can still go to a bookstore and buy The Last Tycoon, and your Last Tycoon, whether it got a lot of eyeballs or not initially, it's going to be there presumably forever. Yeah. So yeah. we live in a different world in terms of that. It's not like... That's you know, if you miss the, the airing of that episode of Party of Five back in those days, until it went into syndication, that was that, right? It's a different world now in terms of sort of shelf life, right? That, that is true, and, and that's nice that The Last Tycoon will exist forever. There was a period of time, right, when Breaking Bad broke out in which the idea of an extended shelf life and people revisiting things actually meant that things could have a revival. So Breaking Bad, which was not an enormous hit early right. on, definitely became, took, off. Became, took off because people watched it off of DVDs uh -huh. and then suddenly it became a big people. deal. Yep. But now there are thousands of shows. So yes, it's great that I have a book on the back shelf of a very large bookstore and periodically somebody will walk down that aisle and look at it. It's really nice that things live forever. Yep. But like I said, you know, the thing you want to do is you want to work with these people year after year. I love that group of people that did Last Tycoon. So, you know, and look, it's the, it's the job. You make things, they work, they don't work, you move on. Yeah. Um, but it's harder to track nowadays what makes something a success than it used to be. I mean, it was still a little weird. You know, you, get your, you got your Nielsen. I remember waking up on, I mean, got a call from the president of the network, like at 7 in the morning that after we aired, giving me the numbers for the night before. <laughs> and we could have a very specific conversation, and we could guess whether we were likely to be okay or not. On Amazon, Two weeks after Last Tycoon was dropped, they called up and said, you're done. They didn't tell us the numbers ever. They didn't tell us exactly what the standard was. They just said, this is just not good enough. Um, and it was it. So, you know, it ends up being a little bit like Thanksgiving dinner. You make it forever and people eat it in 10 minutes. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> right here in the, yeah. yeah. Content, 
I honestly, I, I, I am the wrong person to ask about that because I just deal with it bit by bit. I'm sure those things help. What's the minimum you need? I don't know. I can't answer that question well. You'd probably need to talk to somebody who goes through that process with you. It's just I come at it from a different okay. place. And although I have some of the same issues you do, like how much do I need? What's the, what's the you know, critical mass of the idea that's going to cause somebody to say yes? But I don't know, like, I don't know the minimum answer to that. There's no question that on a show, if an actor commits to doing it, it increases, it, it increases your chances if they're interested in being in business with that actor. But I have not yet done a show in which I went with an actor package. So I haven't, we didn't do that. We, we have had, I mean, we, like with Last Tycoon, almost immediately after, we talked about casting Kelsey Grammer and Matt Bomer and Lily Collins. But, um, but I just haven't done it. So I'm not, I can understand why that's true, but I would be a bad person to answer. I'm not trying to avoid it. No, you, you I need think you're a showrunner, so I'm assuming you're like a showrunner. You said it was similar to a director, and I was wondering since you have so much power as a showrunner, do you have a bit more of a sense of what you want to I think the, th there's no question that the, as I said, the, like the critical mass of your package matters. You have to have some elements that put together, say to them, it's worth taking a risk. At Netflix, they're going to make a show and not make a pilot. So it depends upon, I had a director who was well known, I had uh, a script and a Bible and the commitment from some people. If it had been the certain kind of show, we might have attached a director to, uh, uh, an actor to it, it wasn't that kind of thing. So all those things are true. I just don't wanna, I can't set the minimum level for you about what's necessary on a given thing, I just don't know. I see a sea of hands, more hands have gone up since we started the, Q, the, the questions, but I'm sorry to say we have to, you know, we got a packed day here. So we have to we have to let you. We're going to leave you hungry, uh, not like Thanksgiving dinner. Um, but but I, I hope you maybe can stick around and answer a couple of questions here afterwards. Yes, I have. Uh, yes. But we do need to keep moving here. So I, I just want to sort of uh, wrap up by, of course, thanking Chris Kaiser, but also thanking you all for coming out today and stick around. There's so much more still uh, to come. So uh, thank you and thank you, Chris. Thank you very much.